research interests, which were shaped during my years in Tucson, are ancient food and drink technologies in ancient Israel. In addition to my work as a stone artifact specialist, I've conducted ethnographic study of traditional clay ovens in Jordan and investigated the roles of bread and beer in the ancient Israelite diet. Tonight, however, I will talk about the technology associated with one of the most exciting finds Norma Franklin and I made during our six seasons at Jezreel, wine production. So in this presentation, I will focus on grapes and wine in the southern Levant during the Iron Age, around 1200 to 586 BCE. The Iron Age I, uh, from about 1200 to 1000, is Israel's formative period when early Israelite identity was forged in small village communities in the central highlands. The Iron Age II, from about 1000 to 586, is the period of the kings of Israel and Judah, who ruled from Samaria and Jerusalem, respectively. Sources for viticulture, grape growing, and viniculture, winemaking, during this period include the Hebrew Bible, inscriptions, other artifacts and installations found in archaeological surveys and excavations, and iconographic representations from Israel and Judah's neighbors. The beverage described most frequently by the biblical writers, wine played important roles in the ancient Israelite diet, economy, and cultural and religious life. While the earliest evidence for wine production has been recognized recently in a 6,000 BCE cave in Armenia, and the earliest definitive evidence for wine has been identified in ceramic vessels from Haji Firuz Tepe in Iran, dating just a few, years, a few hundred years later, grapes are native to the land of Israel and thrive in its rocky soils. Grapes and other native fruits, such as pomegranates, may have been fermented much earlier in Israel than current archaeological evidence suggests. Grapes were likely domesticated during the Chalcolithic period, during the 5th, 4th millennium BCE, and wine was exported to Egypt as early as around 3150 BCE during the Early Bronze Age. The recently discovered wine cellar at Middle Bronze Age uh, Kabri, in the context of a palace, uh, that contained 40 50 liter storage jars uh, that contained wine, vividly illustrates the importance of this commodity for the Bronze Age Canaanites. One of the earliest Israelite references to viticulture is the 10th century BCE Gezer calendar, which lists two months of grape harvesting. The vintage season is late summer, and the biblical writers describe the grape harvest as a time to be celebrated with feasting, singing, and dancing. The grapevine is mentioned more than any other plant in the Hebrew Bible, and the Hebrew word for wine, yain, appears 141 times. Many different types of wine are mentioned, including wines named after the locales in which they were made, like the wine of Helbon, made in the vicinity of Damascus, and the wine of Lebanon that was famed for its aroma, according to Hosea 14.7. The vines of Hebron were noted for their large clusters of grapes, and the people of Ephraim were heavy wine drinkers, according to Isaiah 28. Other wines described in the text include mixed or spiced wine and sweet wine, lees and vinegar are also mentioned. Noah was the first vintner, according to Genesis 9.20. The grapevine is listed in Deuteronomy 8 as one of the seven species, the agricultural products that were specialties of the land of Israel. And Psalm 104.15 refers to the vine as a gift from God. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle, and plants for people to use to bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. When the spies returned to Moses after scouting out the promised land in Numbers 13, the bunch of grapes they carried on a pole illustrated the abundance of the land of Canaan. The image, this image is the logo of the Israel Ministry of Tourism, as well as the Carmel Winery, the largest and oldest in Israel. The economic importance of wine in ancient Israel is attested in biblical and archaeological sources. Ostraca, or inscribed potsherds, found in Samaria, capital of the Northern Kingdom, provide information about the wine trade. Um, at Samaria, 68 Ostraca, dating to the 8th century, record small shipments of wine and olive oil to the capital from the communities in the surrounding countryside. Samaria was the center of vineyards, according to passages in Jeremiah and Micah. Vineyards and wineries were valuable commodities in ancient Israel, as evidenced in the story of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21, which I'll discuss later in this presentation. Wine is believed to have been a dietary staple, as it was safer to drink than water. Although wine may have been regularly, av regularly available to some, it played a central role in festivals and celebrations. And the image I have here is a, it's just something neat that appeared recently by um, Tim Frank. And this is a, a house that was studied by my colleague and a former um, student of Bill Deaver's here, uh, Jimmy Harden. And this is a, a house at um, Tel Halif in Judah. And uh, Tim Frank has made this reconstruction of the different rooms 
of this house. And you can see the wine jars that he has reconstructed here in what is um, area ML in that front room, which I thought was a nice illustration. In ritual context, wine was the usual drink offering that accompanied the daily sacrifice, the presentation of first fruits, and other offerings. The grape is also used symbolically by the biblical writers. A fruitful vine was a symbol of an obedient Israel, while wild grapes or an empty vine spoke of Israel's disobedience. The song of the unfruitful vineyard in Isaiah 5 offers information about the context of wine production. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. There's much more that can be said about the context and technology of wine production in ancient Israel. But in order to do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about our work at the Jezreel expedition. So Jezreel is located um, near Afula, Nazareth, where that glade grape cluster is in northern Israel. And as you can see from this map, it's located at the narrowest part of the Jezreel Valley. This is a view looking east toward Jordan. You can see the Gilboa mountain range. And Jezreel, uh, which ex uh, consists of two sites, Tel Jezreel, or Tel Yisrael on this map, and then another lower tell called Tel Ein Yisrael after the spring next to it, is at the intersection of two main international highways. Well, the way of the pa uh, Via Maris, going east-west between um, Egypt and Mesopotamia, and then the way of the patriarchs that head south to uh, Jerusalem. So this site is located in a you know, very important um, location within the Jezreel Valley and has a virtually uninterrupted occupation going back some 7,000 years. So the site of Tel Jezreel was excavated uh, by Tel Aviv University and the British School of Archaeology in the early 1990s. And they focused on the Tel itself, the higher, highest point of the site. And they uncovered a rectangular enclosure dating to the 9th or 8th century BCE during the time of the kings of Israel, perhaps Ahab, perhaps not, that includes, as you can see here on the right, two towers and then a gate complex down here. It's surrounded by a moat. Uh, there is very little evidence for domestic occupation during the Iron Age settlement at this site, however, so it had a different function. So Norma Deaver, when, uh, sorry, Norma Franklin, when uh, she and I started talking about doing a project in 2011, decided that when we uh, were looking at sites, we became interested in what was not known about Jezreel. So we decided to first undertake a survey before deciding where might be a fruitful place to um, excavate at the site. So the first thing we did was commission a LIDAR scan of seven and a half square kilometers of the Jezreel Valley. This is the first time this technology has been applied to an archeological project in Israel. And basically what it does, um, and this is how I understand it, is that uh, it provides a, a topographical model of the site that strips away all of the vegetation. So basically you can see everything on the surface of the site, even in areas uh, that are quite overgrown, um, through these aerial lasers that bounce off the surface. So the model that was created then as a result, you can see here, is devoid of all of the plants and the trees and the weeds and everything else that we um, basically had to confront when we went to do a um, walking survey of the site in 2012. You can even see here all kinds of features, including fish ponds. This is the kibbutz over here where we stay during the season. And over here is a ski slope, Ski Gilboa, believe it or not. And then um, M is the tell. And the spring, Ein Yisrael, is down here, area S. So basically, uh, in June 2012, we went forth with this information, and we divided up the landscape according to these units, and we surveyed them on foot. And we took a group of my undergraduate students uh, here you see them, uh, to give you an idea of what the site actually looks like. I mean, you can't see the ground anywhere, so this LIDAR um, model was very important to us. And we charged through the weeds and we documented everything that we could see. We tied caution tape um, as we walked along to random weeds and trees and things and crawled under barbed wire. The site is not protected, it's not a national park, um, there are no guards there, so I mean, it's not in very good shape at all. And we found lots and lots of really interesting features on the landscape that gave us some ideas about where we should excavate in future seasons, including these um, different tombs from various periods, Roman Byzantine over here, and then perhaps uh, earlier over here. And these were our results. 
Um, after our initial survey season in 2012 then, um, one of the things we did was start to work around with LIDAR models. And so what you're looking at here is the LIDAR that's uh, draped over an aerial view of the um, actual site. And we plotted uh, many of the features that we came across. Um, these have never been published before. And among them are these green squares, which are agricultural installations, meaning probably wine and olive presses for the most part. So just notice here where they're located. Uh, some of them are located up um, closer to the tell itself, sort of um, around the eastern part of it. And then others are located along the slopes closer to the agricultural fields below. So when we were walking um, in the area K in 2012, we came across this. And so we found many features like this on the landscape, um, dozens of them. But this one stood out to us because of the square vat that you can see up there in the top right of the photo, in addition to a number of other features um, cut into the limestone bedrock. So we returned to excavate here in 2013 and found this. So this is an aerial view after two weeks of excavation, and it turns out to be a treading floor with two vats and then a number of other uh, features that are cut into the limestone um, bedrock. So here you can see them, um, the different features are labeled. So A is the treading floor, which is about three by three meters. Um, and then the B and C are the two vats. Vat one or B is the one that's actually connected to the treading floor. And then we have a separate vat and then a number of um, bedrock mortars and a deep basin. So just to give you an idea of the scale, this is what it looked like at the end of the season when we were uh, cleaning it for photography. So just to give you an idea, some Jezreel expedition members are um, there in the photo. So this is not a reconstruction based on our actual winery, but it's the one that's very similar that I found on the internet. And so the method goes like this. Basically, the, our understanding is that the grapes were probably grown very close to the, to the winery itself. And then at, during harvest season, the grapes would be brought to the treading floor and stored there. And then they were trod, and then the wine or the juice before it becomes wine, the, um, the must, then flows down through a channel into one or more fermentation vats. And then it sits there for days or a week, depending. And then the wine, um, after it's been initially fermented, is decanted into jars or perhaps in wineskins, and then stored somewhere cool and dark then for months or perhaps longer than that. So here is a cross section to see that the treading floor slopes down toward the vat. Uh, so this thing was engineered you know, to, um, to use gravity, of course. And then here is the um, channel that connects the treading floor with that one. And so according to ethnographic information and also some biblical uh, references, it looks, it seems that this was probably stopped up somehow with twigs or other materials in order to, um, you know, cut off the flow. Possibly after, when this fermentation vat was in the process of fermenting a vat full of um, juice, more grapes were then dumped on the treading floor and stored there until initial fermentation had ended for the first batch, as grapes are, you know, ripening in succession. So just to give you some idea, because it's hard to conceptualize how much wine is produced you know, by a, a, a winery of this size, this was calculated to, uh, to hold about 21, to 2150 liters or about 3,350 standard wine bottles. That's about a week. And so say during the vintage season, maybe there are four or maybe six pressings. So um, this is a, a lot of wine. This is a lot more wine that was probably, then was probably necessary for daily consumption. What would happen next after the wine was placed into jars, um, as you can see in the top right, this is not from Jezreel, this is from another site in the Jordan Valley, but it shows how a wine jar has been stoppered with a um, clay spherical perforated um, ball, and then it has a, a piece of um, fabric stuck into the perforation um, to allow the ga gases to escape. Even though we um, haven't found where the, the wine jars were actually stored at Jezreel, there are more than 100 of these deep cisterns or pits or silos that are dotting the landscape around Jezreel, so a really large number of them. None of them have been pra you know, properly excavated yet. Uh, but we have comparable uh, pits and cisterns known from many other sites, including Samaria and even a Gibeon, which actually did contain um, the remains of wine um, from the Iron Age that was stored there. So we imagine that perhaps some of the, the wine ended up uh, being stored in some of these um, pits in the area of the winery. So here is a, a plan of the, of the winery, just to give you an idea of some of the, um, you know, the features and how they relate. I wanted to just make note of the darker colored uh, areas. So this is basalt. 
So this area here is obviously you know, a, a volcanic area. And so we have a, a layer of basalt that extends um, down from the Tell all the way into the um, agricultural terrace below. And this limestone formation then sits atop it. When they were excavating the, sec the first vat that they apparently excavated, they came into contact with this basalt boulder and were unable to remove it, which was really interesting. So we have chiseling marks all around the sides, which you can kind of make out in that top left slide. Uh, but they were unable to, um, to actually extract the basalt boulder. So it looks like they actually abandoned this vat and then reorganized the entire uh, winery complex and then you know, cut a new vat and a new treading floor. So here you can see it more clearly. So so you can see the treading floor and the vat that it's connected to. To the right of it, there is this separate vat with the basalt boulder in it. So we think that that was probably one of the, the first things that was cut for this winery. And when they realized they weren't going to be able to cut it deep enough because of this basalt boulder being in the way, they realigned the whole thing. Um, what did they actually do with that vat? We're not sure. Um, maybe it was used for storage. It might have functioned uh, in wine production somehow or perhaps in some other um, industry related to the different um, harvest seasons, which I'll talk a little bit more about. You can see some basalt boulders peeking out of other areas as well. It looks like they're kind of almost like swelling up through the limestone, which isn't exactly what's happening. But basically, it was too hard a stone for them to uh, deal with when they were cutting through the softer limestone. Also among uh, the vats and the treading floor are a number of these bedrock mortars. And so there's one in section, so you can get an idea of what these things look like. And they ha we have more than 24 of them um, scattered around this exposed area. What could they have been used for? When we were looking at comparable wineries from the area, especially the area around the Jezreel Valley, uh, you can see a couple of them on the left here that are you know, sort of rough photographs because they're black and white. This is how they were published. But you can perhaps make out that the treading floors and the vats are much less you know, nicely cut than ours. They're more round. They're a bit rougher looking. And then they also have these um, bedrock mortars or depressions in the stone um, on, at various points around the actual treading floors. So some have speculated that they could have held supporting poles, like we see in the Egyptian New Kingdom representations of wine production, like the top right. And uh, the idea here is that the treaders are hanging on to ropes, you know, suspended from this, um, this wooden apparatus. Or, like as you can see down below, also from Egypt, it possibly could have been used to hold poles to support a, uh, a bag press. And basically, a bag press was used when all of the remaining um, skins and all the other you know, stuff that was left during the, the treading was gathered up and then basically repressed by squeezing it out in order to wring every last bit of you know, wine out of there. And that's what you see here in the bottom right. So these are possibilities. But in our winery, we don't have them aligned in this way with the treading floor. So it seems like something else is going on. Three of them, which are located next to the first vat that was cut, the um, unsuccessful that, are actually connected. So they're not only aligned, but they're also connected by a narrow channel between them, and they also are on a slope. And it has been suggested uh, by some that this could have been used in olive production, perhaps. So when small quantities of olives were being pressed by hand, perhaps with a wooden mortar, then the oil um, would basically carry down the channel by pouring in warm water, the oil would rise to the surface, and then um, go into the next uh, channel. So that's, I mean, into the next um, container. So that's a possibility with this one. Uh, my colleague, Davide Tom, at the University of Haifa has done a number of experiments on these bedrock mortars from other sites. And some of them date all the way back to the Natufian period, so uh, upper Paleolithic period. And they're very similar to ours. And here he is showing the processing of barley using a long wooden pestle. So we don't know. I mean, the wear on these things is um, hard to interpret, in part because a lot of them have been exposed for millennia. But I'm suggesting that some of these were probably much, much older than the winery. And so this exposed surface might have been used uh, in different harvest seasons you know, for many, um, many thousands of years, actually. And perhaps when they cut the winery, they then reused some of these things um, for various aspects of wine production and maybe olive oil production. And then perhaps they continued to use them 
as well as, um, as mortars in the plan and see how they're sort of scattered around. So the only ones that are organized in any way are those, that series of three that's in sort of the middle, uh, just north of the, the um, vat that didn't work. Um, so they're kind of scattered around and there's no clear organization to these things. And so my argument is that they probably um, were used over, over a very long period of time, even perhaps after the winery went out of use. So the patches that you can see on the treading floor there that are sort of stippled are plaster. So fortunately for us, some of an applied plaster floor, what you see um, here on the right, some stones embedded in it, survive. And so we took some samples of the plaster from the uppermost levels and some submitted them for carbon-14 dating. The next slide. And this is what we got, two dates uh, in the first century CE, which suggests then that the last time this particular treading floor was surfaced, I guess, plastered, was the early Roman period. And then it probably went out of use from there. Why? So note again the locations of these different uh, winery installations and olive pressing installations. So our winery is up there on the slope, a bit distant from Tel Jezreel. We also have a cluster, as you can see, and, and the edge of the, of the tell itself of, um, of wineries and olive presses. Some of those were excavated in the 1990s and have been published, and they're very, very different from ours. They, are, they have this tessellation or this sort of mosaic floor. They also are not actual treading floors as much as um, actual presses. So if I have mistakenly referred to our winery as a press, um, I have just, that's been a slip of my tongue. Our winery is not a press. It doesn't have any kind of beam or screw press associated with it. So the grapes were actually you know, stomped underfoot and there was no you know, mechanical means of um, extracting the grape juice other than underfoot. But in the Roman and Byzantine period, it looks like um, wine production was big business at, at Jezreel, but it relocated up closer to the settlement. And so it was probably much easier protected up there, and it consists of uh, wine presses that are very, very different in size and, um, and form than ours. So this is another reason why we think, even though it's very difficult to date rock-cut installations like wineries, that ours might date to as early as the Iron Age, in contrast to these examples, which are clearly Roman or Byzantine in date. Here's another uh, just picture that I pulled off the internet showing another uh, pretty well, uh, basically a pretty well, well cut example, but you can see that mosaic floor. So this is something that's clearly Roman Byzantine in date and not earlier than that. And this is up on the tell itself. So note I haven't said anything about Naboth yet. And often when I'm talking about Jezreel, that's where I start. I start with the biblical text. You know, how do we know what we know about Jezreel? What's its earliest references? You know, do we have any Egyptian texts that talk about Jezreel? Um, what does it say about Jezreel in the Hebrew Bible? But I saved it toward closer to the end to make a point. Basically, um, Israel itself, uh, the word means something like God sows or God makes fruitful. And it's the site that gave its name to the valley and not the other way around. So already in ancient times, certainly by the late Bronze Age, this was known as one of the more fertile parts of the southern Levant. These are some photos that we took during our survey season of some of the crops that are grown um, around the site still today. So the association of fertility and you know, agricultural success um, and possibilities in the Jezreel Valley is something that has been long known. When we get to 1 Kings 21, to the story of Naboth's vineyard, then it's perhaps not surprising that this first story about Jezreel has to do with wine. So according to 1 Kings 21, which I, don't, I won't read this aloud because I'm sure many are familiar with this story and it's, I've put some of it up here for you. Basically, uh, we get the story of a Jezreelite, a man of Jezreel named Naboth, who had a vineyard and it was located next to the palace, as it's translated, of King Ahab of Samaria. And so this has been interpreted as Ahab and his wife Jezebel having some sort of house or palace, like a secondary home of some sort at Jezreel. And basically, Ahab wanted that vineyard and tried to get it uh, from Naboth, and Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. So Ahab went home and was sullen, and his wife said, you know, what are you doing? Um, you know, are you not the king of Israel? And she schemed to have Naboth killed, and he was stoned to death eventually by the men of Jezreel. And then when Ahab heard that Naboth had died, he went out and took possession of this property. So. 
there's a lot that we can read into this, and some of my colleagues that I've worked with at Jezreel over the years have, have written about um, Naboth in a kind of new, new light, a new understanding of the story in recent years. So I won't go into that. But basically, this is a very, very valuable piece of property. Um, Naboth the Jezreelite was not you know, some poor peasant. He was a wealthy landowner. I mean, if he controlled something, even you know, a fraction of the kind of winery that we've excavated, then this guy was a wealthy person. So this was very interestingly valuable property that Ahab couldn't get hold of. And then we hear about Jezreel again in terms of you know, dramatic biblical events playing out at the site in 2 Kings 9. And so at this point, Ahab has um, died. And his son, Yoram, is on the throne until there is a usurper, Jehu, Yehu, to the throne, who stages a coup d'etat. And basically, he chases the king of Israel and the king of Judah back to Jezreel uh, from the east. And he meets them at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. So there's a memory you know, on, the, on the surface somewhere in the landscape of this particular land you know, being owned, having been owned by, um, by Naboth. And so eventually what happens is that the king of Israel is killed by the usurper Jehu, and he is basically thrown into um, Naboth the Jezreelite's plot of land uh, in fulfillment of the curse, a uh, prophecy basically that, uh, that cursed um, Ahab's family. And then the king of Judah then continues to Megiddo where he eventually dies of his wounds. And then, very famously, uh, we have Jehu coming into Jezreel and ordering that um, Jezebel, the queen mother, you know, be thrown down from, from the house, and she is uh, trampled by his horses, and the dogs you know, eat everything of her except for her skull and the palms of her hands and the soles of her feet, and she's buried at Jezreel. So, very uh, exciting, bloody events um, happening here. And there's blood and wine and all kinds of gore and other things that are, you know, the context is Jezreel, and we have this memory of this particular part of the site as being um, associated with this, with this individual, this Jezreelite. So then have we found Nabus Vineyard. So this was a, an exercise I did for one of my undergraduate classes uh, in uh, controlling the, the message. You know, how much do archaeologists have the ability to control the story, to control the narrative? And an example, an easy example for us would be the Jezreel um, winery because, you know, we published a couple of, of articles and other reports about the winery and Never saying anywhere, of course, in print that we found Naboth's vineyard because, you know, who knows if we have Naboth's vineyard or if there was a Naboth or, you know, any of that. So it's not something that we could, you know, actually say. But that doesn't mean that various uh, news outlets picked up the story and ran these headlines. Just another example. And they keep coming. So these are from 2017. You know, we excavated the winery in 2013. And it seems like there's some new stories coming out every now and again for who knows what reason. But, um, you know, it's a find of biblical proportions. I just want to show you here the location of our winery from a different perspective. So what we're looking at now is the LIDAR with um, an aerial overlaying laying the LIDAR so you can see, you know, what the actual land looks like. And the circle is the winery's location, so it's at the border of the slope going down to the agricultural terrace which would be a pretty ideal place to actually have a vineyard when you think about this. And the vineyard should be in the same area as the, um, the winery itself. And then up on the highest point of the Tel, Tel Jezreel, uh, in the rectangle is where uh, you know, Jehu would have come chasing the um, king of Israel and Judah after his coup d'etat. And so as he came up from the east, he would have traveled along basically the same road that you see follows up here toward this defunct ski slope, um, up toward the site to the gates. And in doing so, he would have passed the area of our winery. So it is actually located in the right spot uh, for, this, you know, for this story to actually um, perhaps have some, some sort, of, sort of context. So what we can take from this is not that we found Naboth's vineyard or we have proof of Naboth or anything like that, but rather that the writers of these stories knew this place 
and they knew about the association between Jezreel and wine production, and they even knew perhaps where some of its wineries, including uh, perhaps one of its largest and most well-cut winery, actually, uh, was exposed at one point. And so the location works with the biblical story in a really interesting and fun way. Something ironic that happened also, that's gotten us a little bit of attention, um, is in 2012, a new winery opened up called the Jezreel Valley Winery, the same year we started our project at Jezreel, which has been really fun. We take students there regularly on field trips, because it's educationally, you know, it's, it's important for them to go to wineries. Next slide, please. And so we've actually had um, discussions with the winemakers there, and they've been great. And you know, we've talked about working uh, with them on various efforts, and we've you know certainly bought a lot of their wine over the years. Interestingly, they're not located in the Jezreel Valley, though. They're actually located in the Beit Natofa Valley near Hanatan. <laughs> so it brings me all the way back to my early years here at the U of A, working on stone artifacts that Beth excavated at Tel Awaliat, just down you know just down the slope, basically from this winery. So thank you all very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions and talk more about our discovery. Thank you.